Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. I am joined this afternoon by Mark Tomlinson who is going to be presenting a webinar entitled Performance in a DevOps World. Now Mark is a performance engineering and software testing consultant. He's also the host of the PerfBytes podcast and Mark has spoken at a number of testing conferences including the Software Test Professionals Conference, the Star East, Star West, Test Bash and Cast. So we're delighted he's um, agreed to come along today to present for you guys. And if you have any questions for Mark, please type them into the questions field there on your control panel and we will go through as many of your questions as we can at the very end of the webinar. And don't forget, you don't have to wait until the end of the webinar to type your questions. You can type them at any point. So that's enough from me. Let me now hand you over to today's presenter, Mark. Hello, Mark. We go. Derry, can you hear me? I can indeed. Awesome. And I think you're, let's see there. How's that? Great. We can see it. Perfect. Let's talk. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. We, let's talk about performance in this uh, wacky new thing called the DevOps world. Are you ready, everybody? Let's go. Um, uh, I, Mark, my name is Mark Thomas. It was a great intro from Darren. This is really awesome. If you guys want to follow me, I've updated because the security people in the world told me you shouldn't have any of your common usernames as your Twitter handle, so I changed it to my new podcast, which is Mark on Task. So if you want to go on Twitter right now, you could say, oh, they, and then if some of you want to go change your Twitter handle because you're like, hey, that's a good idea. That should not be my username. Uh, that's, a, that's a smart thing to do there. Uh, but today I'd like to spend time uh, most importantly talking about this, this crazy thing called DevOps and particularly my experience uh, as a performance engineer and performance tester getting into uh, the DevOps world. Um, and so there's a journey and so I want to talk a little bit about my history and the history of performance testing and performance engineering as we've known it uh, over many, many years. Um, the transition to DevOps, like how did we particularly get here? Uh, and in my, in my current role working with PayPal, uh, we've, we've taken lots of steps to make trends and putting lots of things in place. But I've been working with many other customers too, so this, is, this presentation is absolutely not specifically about PayPal, uh, it's more general. Um, in, uh, in performance engineering in DevOps is sort of, a, sort of the prescriptive future for what are the things that we essentially need to uh, employ or enable in DevOps for performance. Uh, and that's kind of the outline of what we'll go. So let's jump in with the journey and maybe more specifically my own journey. And so if I take a look at this picture, it's a lovely painting. I guess it's not a, not a photograph, it's a painting. Um, there's, there's a couple of hints as to what you're looking at uh, in this picture uh, in terms of being an engineer because uh, there's a, you'll see there's some people on the floor. There's a guy who looks like a, a worker, the labor, uh, a layman. Um, there's a hammer on the floor. There's sort of some other sketchbooks or designs. There seems to be some kind of architecture tools, um, you know, some kind of a compass of some sort to actually, you know, put together, uh, you know, uh, the, the sketches, etc. There's another person on the, on, the, uh, on the far left, as you can see, there's people sort of looking across the room at other people. They're engaged in some sort of heated debate. They're influencing each other's thoughts. Um, there's a guy casually in the back. That's, that's probably the scrum master. He's just sort of watching stuff happen. Doesn't really do anything. Maybe shows up and brings donuts every now and then uh, to a scrum, to a stand-up or something. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. The, uh, but there are also on the right side is the money. Because you can see these guys that have sort of the high-collared outfits, they're, there's, you know, they're more well-to-do, they have a dog, which means that sort of, from a stature perspective, it puts them above nature. Um, but these guys are pretty much in the bridge building business, as you can see, this sort of bridge aqueduct structure in the back, uh, in the background there. And so here's all the different move uh, pieces and all the different players. Of course, there's no women. There's no women engineers back there uh, in the photograph, or in the picture. So we'd have to change, change that as well. Uh, in modern day. Uh, my point being in this picture that there are lots of elements about engineering and not necessarily a reference to being a tester and testing, even though it's sort of inherently built in 
potentially to how these guys went about constructing and building and engineering these things. Interaction with the business, interaction with labor and the people that are employing and constructing things, uh, interaction with the designers and the architects. Uh, so it's a very interesting way to understand engineering separate from testing, which is part of my own history as a performance tester starting in a member of the QA department. A long-term waterfall, some of the first uh, first uh, jobs I was ever on was working as a, as a team member with 18 month or two year releases where we went through long, uh, long phases of writing performance test cases, running performance tests, finding defects and even reporting them and trying to figure out which ones we needed to fix. Maybe they were iterative within that waterfall phase but very, very long phase gate B and B type model stuff. And somewhere after being a performance tester for the first I don't know, maybe six years of my career uh, a while ago, uh, we started calling this thing performance validation because it wasn't so much that we, we knew what the external group was. We had a name change. Now I, I, I did some work and I saw a lot of people working as the performance center of excellence. It was sort of a standalone group with a standalone funding. Maybe they were connected up to management in a different way. But they, we just changed the name to be validation, which I think may be aligned with some other methodologies that we wanted to say. They weren't necessarily part of Agile, but in the enterprise space, you wanted to stand away as I have a separate group doing performance validation. Um, and, and then in recent times, like within just the last five or six years, uh, everyone seemed to be uh, referred to it as a performance engineer and the role I saw changing versus being somebody who was a member of a COE and doing all kinds of tests similar to before. Now we saw exploratory performance, uh, a lot of emphasis on the agile iterations or fast iterations around optimization and tuning, and then wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. So I call that sort of performance consulting and advising. You could even be internally at your company doing consulting and advising to other engineers, other developers, other testers. Uh, and even the ops department, of course, in their triage and, and getting ready and release management. So I, I, starting out as a load tester, then living in this era of sort of enterprise performance validation and now sort of operating as an internal or even external consultant or advisor around performance is kind of the history that I've experienced or witnessed other people go through. But when it comes to calling yourself an engineer, uh, I had an interesting experience uh, on a call with Jim Duggan as a, as a Gartner analyst years ago. And I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm paraphrasing. I know I put this in quotes, but I think it's uh, only then can you consider your work to be part of performance engineering. Otherwise, you're just doing testing. Some, I haven't influenced the mind of a developer, an engineer, or an architect. So if I actually want to earn my title, if I can't just, if I'm not just calling myself a performance engineer because I want to make more money, because I can get a better job or something like that, which a lot of people do. I'm not just a load tester. I'm a performance engineer. Then it changes your thinking. It changes your world, because first of all, you need to know enough about how a system can be modeled before any code is written. So how can you test the idea of performance and throughput and capacity without actually having any code really written? Say it's a brand new app. And if you're focused on running scripts and validating load, you're really just being a tester. In this case, you would need to understand architecture and get things running. You obviously need to test that model or the idea for performance risk because you're sort of imbibing this idea that the code shouldn't be written a certain way because it may not perform. So risk becomes inherently part of your proactive modeling and understanding as a performance engineer. Of course, all the other things that follow from that are, I, if I really want to understand the model, I need to understand the big picture in order to write small components of code. Now, the developer might be understanding small components of code, so I'm influencing their thoughts as a performance engineer. But to be honest, if I'm really working with architects and developers, I'm having to learn some of these small components of code anyway. Um, it's a collaborative approach. If we're going to influence the minds of developers or system architects before they write code, well, we better we better hang out with them. We better get to know them. We better spend a lot of time sort of infecting their brains with the ideas of performance, capacity, throughput, all these kinds of things. And that requires a change to your thinking and your relationships, different than sitting in a different department or being uh, reporting up through other parts of the organization as a tester. 
uh, or even just a person in the COE kind of model. Um, so performance engineering is really, if you think it, you can, you can some call it more proactive, but to me it's more engaged and infectious. You're actually bringing uh, ideas around performance and capacity across the entire life cycle. So where does this performance engineering thing fit in the whole history of computing, about, of, of creating software and the modes and different things? Uh, and if we go all the way back to the 1950s, it kind of started with this thing called continuous improvement, uh, which was sort of a Deming, uh, kind of the total quality management was way back in the mainframe era. But now everyone, you know, Jess Humble and these guys wrote a book called Continuous Delivery. You notice that's also in like 2005. But the word continuous goes back, you know, 50, 60 years, uh, which is kind of crazy, statistical process control. And then we get into the 980s, we've got just-in-time uh, everything, just-in-time pharmacy, just-in-time delivery, just-in-time inventory, whatever you did just-in-time, then you did it just-in-time, and that's why we came up with that phrase. Um, for me, I started somewhere in the middle around client server and the old people process technology. And any junior IT marketing manager will oftentimes just pick up, if it's a technical tool, they'll try to explain everything in people process and technology. And then they're doing that as late as 2015, 16. Oh, it's, well, we're really all about people processing technology. Well, that was back in IT service management and ITIL in the mid-90s. But that's when client server uh, created two-tier kind of client server. We got away from the mainframe for the first steps. And we really gave birth to the web around mid late 90s, 2000, where then we saw frequent delivery responses just to change. Uh, SOA services, so we get XML, uh, massive XML uh, SOA architectures moving in. And oh, oh, lo and behold, 2010, automated testing and infrastructure. That's funny, because I was sort of doing automated testing in 1993 way back in the client server era. So okay, fine, so we're doing automated testing. And check out this last one, the latest one. We're in the cloud. We're using these clouds and APIs to be anti-fragile. And I, I love anti-fragile because I, I'm in the anti-fragility business as a tester. It's not no longer quality. I'm an anti-fragility engineer, right? That's, uh, that's where I'm gonna spend my time. But if we think about um, how we got to DevOps in this, in this, uh, in this line of, of, of sequence. Um, we really had separate development and separate operations all the way back to purpose-built kind of jobs for doing performance work uh, and really doing, you know, bringing performance into DevOps. It, the tools went through a change. Capture playback tools were used in between, you know, before DevOps came to exist. Um, and really, client server in the performance world, that's when LoadRunner can, kind of was born, 89, 90. And that's where I got hooked uh, on doing large load tests that blew stuff up, uh, which is really kind of exciting. And prior to that, you know, we're build your own tools kind of stuff. So then we get to the late 90s and 2000s, and of course, LoadRunner starts to expand. Other web-based tools start to expand. We've got the uh, things to become quality center and performance center and all these kinds of things start 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 exploding but also around the 2000s with the invention of more open source software there's a little bit of performance tools and JMeter and things starting in the early 2000s it's very interesting and then you know uh, before whoops I kind of went to the wrong slide there before we move on there's another thing that happened around 2001 and some of you might be able to guess what happened around 2001 and that would be the dot com bust and there was a lot of really, a lot of criticism and a lot of IT spend that came to a screeching halt right about 2002, 2003. Things really changed. And up until this point, there was a lot of waterfall. We had just taken the steps into extreme programming. The early era of agile was happening at this time. And then the web blew up in our face because people had crappy business plans, which was really kind of funny. Um, so this historic value of performance had been going since the 1950s, and we kept doing it that way because, well, a couple of things. One, technology was relegated to a basement of geeks mostly running reports. You're running on a mainframe client server. You maybe have some data entry and you start seeing that, but for the most part, big business value for client server really came out of still running huge reports on the back end of systems so that you can make financial forecasting so that you can do all sorts of interesting. Most of the systems along this were all closed. Like we just saw the tip of the iceberg on open 
source happening and compiled delivery mechanisms uh, were, were really ruled the day because things were closed. If you wanted to change and fix a bug, you ha it took a heck of a lot of liv heavy lifting just to get a fix out to production. Um, so there were really, really big, unchangeable releases that thus had very big risks. If you, the cost of a bug, if you had, remember those curves from Gartner were, if you can fix it before production, it's way cheaper than in, you know, trying to fix a, a, a failure or a bug that was enormous in production. Um, and we used that model through this entire time frame uh, to, in order to prove the worth of quality, the value of, of working early and shifting left before we even called it that. The other thing that was interesting in the corner office, our executives that were controlling the spend were very insecure about technology because it was all very big risk, very big releases, and if you, they would spend a large amount of money to make sure that IT was working properly. They also, and no, a lot of companies didn't even have really serious cutting edge IT. They didn't have a website. They didn't have these new apps. There was no mobile, no cloud. So it was a real competitive differentiator up until about 2003 as the web kind of took its first gasp and uh, we, were, we didn't know what was going to happen. And that really indicated the transition that we started as an industry with the ingredients to get to DevOps. And that transition, I think, has one first starting point, which was about May 2003, this fantastic criticism from Nicholas Carr of our industry, basically stating that if every company has IT, then IT really doesn't matter because it's no longer a competitive differentiator. Everyone's got some SAP running. Everyone's got a, a little website running. Everyone's got this running. There are no there, and and of course Nick, being the visionary he was, uh, that's sarcasm. Um, he, he was basically stating that hey, you know, we're you know who cares about IT? I'm going to give you carte blanche, Mr. or Ms. Uh, uh, corner Office Executive CFO. I'm going to give you carte blanche permission to start cutting costs in IT. Cut your software costs, consolidate these things. You shouldn't, it's not really changing your company. Let's just, let's just make this, just start cutting those costs because that's how you're going to be really competitive is to just come out of this crash of the dot-comness and uh, you know, cut, cut all this IT spending. So IT, for all practical purposes in 2003, was dead and of course Everybody moved on to a housing bubble about that time, and we know how, how well that worked out, at least in, in America. Um, if every company has IT, no, nobody has an advantage. Investments in IT technology do not pay off. Everyone had a website, and then the web took a little bubble crash there. Uh, the 2001 dot-com bubble burst. We lost faith in IT. The world is shrinking because the Internet is rapidly maturing. Great. So if IT is dead, what changed right there about 2001? Well, our next steps, just for performance, we started seeing all these integrated center of excellence suites. So all, you know, IBM Jazz, Microsoft Team System, uh, the Quality Center, Performance Center, Load Runner, all this stuff was now an integrated suite where we're going to do two things. One, we're going to consolidate all that licensing to try to perceptively save money for a customer. Uh, secondarily, from a staffing perspective, you could staff those COEs now from all over the world. So you could have people from India and China. The globalization of the skills workforce mean, meant your COE could be located globally, and some of those COE suites were designed licensing-wise to enable that. It also meant that they targeted, as a COE, exclusively really going after the enterprise domain. And around Windows Server 2003, uh, I was working at Microsoft, and we targeted you know, Microsoft Server, uh, Windows Server in the enterprise, going after the enterprise. Um, but there were a lot of startups in this area that were doing SOA things, and they were kind of scrappy grassroots archi architects, and they are started investing in open source. Now, why would you invest in open source? Well, all the big money was sort of at the enterprise level, and these guys sort of said, hey, you know, we can build an entire product based on open source and still have an open source product, the commercial or the, the community tool or community edition, uh, things like Eclipse. There's the free version of Eclipse and then you could buy Eclipse or there's the free version of, of Red Hat, right? The early version or you could buy the services to go with. See all this, this sort of burst in open source that sort of lay, laid the way for us to exist in the cloud economy which was cloud-based tools. Now all, even the enterprise guys were going after the cloud. But I could take an open source thing, run it on an AMI really, really cheap, and my startup can just blossom because so many users can use it. And at the same time, that means we can run tremendous amounts of open source 
across that piece. So there was a big shift that happened in 2003 with this explosion in open source and a movement to the cloud. And to me, those are the ingredients that brought performance full on ready to, in, to 2017 where we can step into, uh, per, into DevOps. Now, along this time, uh, I think it was in about 2007, 2008, our good friend Alberto Savoia uh, did us a great favor in the testing world and said, test is dead. He came out as a Grim Reaper and just lovely amount of theater. Of course, he was completely wrong about that, but the theory gave, again, much like Nick Carr, it gave permission to people to, you don't have to test anymore, right? So test is dead, testing has failed and died for whatever reason, and I don't think I didn't agree with it. And of course, DevOps is now the natural outcome after the death of testing. So we all freaked out that test is dead, and then things started to get really weird. We didn't even coin the DevOps stuff. In 2000, I'd say 2009, 2010, was really we saw DevOps showing up in the marketing department. Um, and things really started to get weird because we started changing all the names, um, and we had to disguise ourselves as testers because if we use the test word, we're out of business. We, we don't have testers. There's no test in DevOps. There's no biz in DevOps. There's no security. There's nothing. There's just dev. There's just ops. So you better get hip with your language. So we stopped using the T word for tests, and we, we just talk about experiments. Defects are now feedback. Nice soft language. Defects sound so negative, don't they? There's something defective with you. Uh, so let's just try an experiment, and maybe we'll... Maybe we'll pass, maybe we'll fail, who knows? But it's so fun to do experiments uh, and feedback. Uh, performance, performance testing, load tests, we're gonna call them game day exercisers. And you can, you, we're, gonna do a, uh, we're gonna do a spike, uh, we're not gonna see, I can't use the T word. We're gonna do a game day exercise where we have, in 30 seconds, ramp up to 10,000 users and we're gonna sustain that. And they go, oh yeah, that's a great game day exercise. Uh, how did you learn to do that? And I said, well, it's called a spike test and I've been doing it for 25 years. How are you today? And uh, they're like, oh, that's a game day exercise. We, we don't do tests. We do game day exercises. Um, requirements are now experiments. What kind of experience does my end user want to have? Or a, uh, in a story, uh, agile story, you would actually describe the experience in detail in, in form. But it's no longer a requirement of the system. It's something we desire to have uh, of the system as an experience. Scripts are now called automation. Metrics are now called analytics, because that sounds smarter. Sounds more academic, right? I could charge more as a consultant if we're going to do some analytics. No, what are you coming up with? Business metrics, same thing. Quality, as we know now, is anti-fragile. And a machine is now a virtual machine. It's not the same. If I say, well, can you give me access to the resources on the machine? What's a machine? Our machines are virtual. Well, you know, does your machine have a CPU, a disk, memory, network? Yes, but it's not a machine. It's a virtual machine. I'm like, okay, whatever you want to call it, call it a virtual machine, i got to get used to that because they're spinning up in the cloud everywhere. A lot of things changed in our tools. Um, first of all, if you're going to do automation now, your tool is going to be some kind of vegetable name, cucumber, lettuce, pickle, tomato, uh, with some mayonnaise and a special sauce. I, I mean, you could do a turkey burger, veggie burger. I think we need some new tools. Maybe we go down the meats route, you know, different kinds of meats, ham, pork, you know, that would be kind of good. Um, uh, there is a tremendous number of testing tools that are now uh, blossoming in the open source world, so much so that the commercial tools are even supporting integrations uh, like you would see with LoadRunner supporting JMeter, Sosta supporting JMeter, uh, with Cloud Test and some other pieces, and these cloud vendors that are actually using the open source quite well to fuel their commercial uh, endeavors. Um, profiler, which we used to have for years all the way back to, you know, really, really early, any kind of code you could profile. Now we'd call them diagnostics. I'd even say we get away from diagnostics and we go into monitoring is now performance management and or digital performance uh, management, which is really a digital performance excellence kind of thing. Um, logging, really popular, made popular now by Splunk and other Elasticsearch uh, kind of ELK stack kind of capabilities. Uh, we heard this old phrase, real user monitoring. So we're not actually going to synthetically test the site. We're going to use RUM, real user monitoring. Uh, your bug tracker is now going into JIRA or open up a ticket. We no longer have a separate good old you know, a, a bug tracking kind of thing as a separate sector. It's all integrated in these large uh, software ALM stacks. Uh, a lot of Microsoft Windows shops started having Macs, and because they had the Linux kernel, it had a tremendous number of tools available uh, for OSX that you couldn't get necessarily natively to run a Windows, or a lot of sort of 
shops leaning towards Agile and DevOps started running almost the entire development staff and testing staff are running on Mac. Uh, and I saw that happen, you know, like an explosion just within the last uh, six or eight years. Um, Unix really didn't just the old Solaris, the old AIX, even some of the old HP UX that we had over the many, many years have really completely moved over into Linux now supporting OpenStack because the cloud platforms are mostly running on Linux and OpenStack. Uh, it, it, with the exception of some specialized cloud vendors, even Oracle's own cloud vending maybe runs on Sun. Now, to complete these weird transitions where you change all the names of everything, we may also need to change our, uh, our appearances. So for people, um, the people working in IT were no longer the lab coat geeks in the basement. They started having beards, right? So facial hair for men. And if you're and and man or woman, I'm not trying to you know be gender stereotyped here, but you're going to do some sort of coloring in your hair. I mean, like a swath of purple, something really hip and cool, right? I'm an old white guy, so I can say things about you know people, young people who are like, all right, you're going to have really good piercing. I see, you know, oh, the the you're, this is a DevOps team. Yeah, there's some weird piercing, maybe in the eyebrow. You got a rook in the ear, something like that. Uh, randomly, anywhere, you never, you'd see them all, tattoos. I actually, to, to work in DevOps, it was a requirement. I went out and actually got my own tattoos, which are good. Hats are really important in the DevOps world, so you can get a non-logo, because you don't want to be sort of affiliated with a brand, but it's sort of authentic, so maybe it's an old fedora from the 1950s, you know, it's a, it's a little hipster, the ironic hipster thing, but it seems very cool in the DevOps world. And of course, if you're in from the dev team, you're probably going to be into microbrews and making your own beers. If you're from the ops team, you're probably drinking single malt scotch and getting into all sorts of flights of strange scotch tasting things. And then I also recommend, if you want to complete the disguise, learn some kind of instrument or get into filmmaking. So something that's a little bit esoteric, maybe it's acoustic instruments, you play, the, play a, a, a zither, or uh, you play uh, the banjo, probably a lot of banjo guys in there with, with uh, robust beards and facial hair. Anyway, just so everyone knows, if you walk into a DevOps shop, and this is really a true story, these things may shock you. Like This does not look like the normal sort of geeky uh, old IT department of the past. These are fun, cool, kind of hip people who are using technology in very hip and cool kinds of ways. So you have to get comfortable with that if you're going to make your transition into DevOps. The other thing that really happened uh, is that things got smaller. And in particular, um, project timelines got shorter because we started working in Agile. We transformed out of you know V model, waterfall, and moved into Agile. XP helped us get there at the beginning. But a lot of shops are you know, doing monthly iterations, maybe, you know, two-week sprints and a monthly iteration. Uh, and the project timelines to achieve things got smaller, which means the releases themselves were smaller because you, a smaller team would only work focused on getting particular features or particular stories out. So things, you know, contrast this with my career 25 years ago, big 18-month releases, maybe, maybe even major releases only once or twice a year. For, for software or for whatever, you know, production systems, even back office systems, would only do changes maybe once a year, once every two years. So these releases got really much, much smaller. And of course, they got smaller, the features themselves got smaller, which means if less changes were being made, there's a lot less risk. So with a smaller change, you have smaller risk. And if there's smaller risk, that means you probably have smaller tests. So my value as a load tester was running these very large load tests that included all these kinds of things. And now, wow, to do a performance test, I'm really only testing a very small subset of features that are going to get released. And I need to sort of do trends on version 1, version 2, version 3 with very tight iterations in the load testing. The teams themselves got smaller. So I myself am right now the only load tester uh, in my group and, uh, and and a performance engineer in my group helping people get on board. Uh, I actually help conduct the integrated performance test uh, routines uh, and get things to run monthly, get things to run weekly, and take care of a lot of ad hoc performance testing. So the teams themselves got smaller. Those large COEs potentially aren't really going to continue. They're going to break off and, and really work from a DevOps model uh, integrated with development and operations on these new teams. The other thing that got weird was this phrase shifting to the left. Um, as I point out, uh, extreme programming and agile be have become very, very dominant. And a lot of people talk about moving their practices for performance to the left. 
So testers and developers paired up, moved upstream. So now instead of having a performance tester wait until everything was built and at the last minute you're like, run the load test and tell me if it worked on a special separate team, I'm actually working as a performance engineer analyzing the story, how are we going to build this, what are the business requirements, and as I spent more time as a performance thinker or infector uh, in those dev teams with functional testers, business analysts, and other folks, those teams started blending together. So I'm you know, currently in, in a blended team as a DevOps, a performance guy in a DevOps team. And no one really cares, like you don't have a, if there's some other issue and I can use my skills and help out, I help out and do that. I collaborate on the stories, maybe collaborate even on some sprint planning if they're uh, if we're planning on either not a project but something for that sprint that is really, really important from a performance uh, standpoint. I can get pulled in at any point. So that shifting to the left is is uh, is a real thing. It's not just some sort of football dance that you would do. Uh, or and as my friend Andy Grabner puts it, you can shift to the right uh, and go towards ops, but you really just want to keep shifting all the way to the right, all the way around until you come and meet up on the left again. It's sort of like going all the way around the world. And let me show you what that looks like from a DevOps perspective. For a few other trends, um, there's the, the cloud and global business. Uh, so technology and websites translated into multiple languages being hosted around the world on the cloud was a massive trend that basically freed up people from their old school IT roles. So I no longer did I have like a guy that just kept the hardware running. I no longer had a guy, you know, running printer tonage. I, it, it, the the on-premise SAN administrator that kept the local labs running. Now all of that was highly automated and replicatable all around the world within the cloud. And it may only take one or two person with some scripting skill, some automation skill, with some operating system or kernel know-how, and some pretty good networking know-how that that IT ops team started to change pretty dramatically. The second thing is, as I said, things got smaller. There's a lot of people making the move to DevOps because, wow, we built a monolithic web service infrastructure based on a bunch of different workloads running on the same machine. And if I, it's like a Jenga. If I want, if I want to put, make change to one little component, well, first of all, I I got to retest the entire thing for integrity because it's in the shared memory heap space uh, and I need to make sure under load all of the garbage collection and tuning and the heap uh, configurations are there for the JVM tuning to make sure it'll scale, especially if I have heterogeneous workloads. Six components really like this GC setting, these 12 components like a different GC setting and I'm running them all in the same heap. Well, there's a lot of good performance reasons to adopt microservices and when you look at where the cloud is now with Lambda, serverless computing, all these guys in DevOps are like, you know, I don't, I don't have a big app, big process, big release, need my ops guys hands on everything. I'm actually spinning little components up and getting right from development, right from my desk, click, 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 boom, and out it goes right live on the web. I could test it even before I go live. Um, that's always a good idea. Um, so the microservices strategy is taking, in the last two and a half years, uh, is really just it's technical that things were too monolithic and we need to break them out. And so that made good sense to me as well. Um, then I see automation and continuous integration, continuous delivery made the biggest change. Uh, everyone started getting an automated pipeline and they started optimizing code to get pushed down the pipeline, I'll say horizontally, versus just being concerned with what happened in your silo vertically. So if I'm a dev, I'm concerned with dev, and happens downstream, I don't care. And that's, you know, every ops guy in the world is like, you just throw that I love dog doo-doo over the wall and I have to make it run in ops. And the ops guys are like, well, I'm just here downstream and I'm supposed to take care of everything. So I don't really like that. So we sort of uh, turn it horizontally and build a pipeline that helps confidently accelerate the testing effort and integrate and move things along the pipeline to get them into production. And so we arrive somehow through these trends the tool changes, the name changes, this weird journey uh, from sort of waterfall through Agile and XP, sort of breaking down the silos uh, in all these things to the DevOps world. So let me talk a little bit more specifically about what I think DevOps world uh, from what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day job and where I think we're headed, uh, but also you know with other companies I talk to. 
there are three, for those of you that haven't fully studied DevOps and you're coming from a testing or performance background exclusively, these may be uh, new ideas, uh, not new ideas, but new ideas the way that the DevOps guy put this together. And the three concepts that they come up with, one, uh, three core principles underpinning DevOps, and you'll find this in both the Phoenix project described, the I'm currently reading the uh, DevOps handbook, this Gene Kim's DevOps handbook, there's an O'Reilly book as well on DevOps. I'll also pick up some of this from the older book, Continuous Delivery, uh, from Jess Humble and I think Nick Farley. Great books. Uh, we, I can, we can tweet those out in the uh, questions. But we combine these three th concepts and maybe, maybe a little academic, we call it systems thinking. And from the testing world, you guys will remember Jerry Weinberg. Jerry Weinberg has a fantastic book about testing and systems thinking, seeing, seeing the interconnectedness of things as an opportunity to change your context and test. So systems thinking is more about being interconnected um, and not seeing things in a silo, uh, both systems-wise and people-wise. Feedback loops, remember our defects are now feedback? Well, we want to have lots and lots of feedback, and we want to have them in concentric loops, looping all over the place so we can see, how's my code doing today, now? How's it doing in this other? How's it doing in the future version? How's it doing you know, out there in the world? Give me feedback about how it's doing. And then take that feedback and use it in experimentation and learning, um, which is very different than, say, judgment. Remember the old school testing was all pass, fail, shall pass, thou shall fail. And uh, I have to assess this as a tester, and I'm doing assessment and judgment and validation. And in the DevOps world, we, we take information and it's no longer sort of deterministically pass or fail. It's more, well, it sort of fails and so let's experiment some more and learn from our experimentation and, and then move on. And the image that they use uh, very often is showing this loop between dev iterating uh, many times and in, the, in that iteration in the middle there, that's where I put test uh, or experimenting. And those little feedback loops give of experimentation tell us, hey, we make it all the way to ops with our code. And then we learn from ops and loop that information, shifting right all the way to come back left. And that's sort of this image. If I put the business on one end and the customer on the other, we've got ourselves kind of a, a map and a model for understanding these three concepts uh, uh, coming from that. Now, when I think about DevOps, and particularly this this flow, this idea of flow, and I have a picture of a very, very cool, fast-flowing river, and I usually ask the class, give me an idea of what are some of the things you would, words you would use to describe this, and they use words like swift, they are uh, uh, smooth, so there's nothing, uh, there's no resistance or massive resistance, so things are moving very quickly, cool or cold, uh, and they also think the water, the water might be hot for all we know, but I think it's sort of cool. It's kind of mossy. It looks very Pacific Northwest. There's movement in the picture. It looks lush. It does not look sparse like a, like, a, like a little river in the middle of nowhere that's just trying to hang on and provide life and water. This is in a very lush environment, so with a lot of water moving, you have an opportunity to grow a lot of plants and lovely trees. Um, I know, no one's ever really brought up fish. is to understand that flow, this interconnectedness between people, between components, is the first really part of a performance engineering flow for DevOps. And I use these three circles uh, repeatedly. So you see development on the left, which is the very, very unreal world. Uh, maybe you have some performance practices in a production-like world. It's not quite prod, but it's close to prod. And uh, as close as you can get, which is hard to do, uh, and then production performance, which is the very, very, very real world, where we actually, the value stream delivers whatever we build to the customer. And we hello that starts in development, I curve it over the top, and you get a bunch of work done in development, then if it's healthy enough, you promote that automatically with the pipeline into the performance practices for further testing. And then if you, if you pass all the performance tests, now I look at this and say that's a phase gate. And you know, did I, am I healthy enough to get out of development? And am I healthy enough to get out of performance practice? And the truth is, I like to install performance practices, the highly automated pipeline for automation uh, performance, in between development and production, and also institute a feedback flow. 
So here's the same three circles. I take information from production, I do some triage, maybe I escalate uh, issues back into performance for reproduction or investigation. Maybe I have strategic scenarios that I'm learning from prod and I tune up future scenarios for stress tests or spike tests or what, whatever we need to do. Might take information about performance, bring that into architecture, the development team and underpinning future development hey, we have a limitation in this architecture or that architecture, a particular platform. And how we achieve that flow, a promotional flow and a feedback flow, is that we, if we start at the very beginning, first off, you need to contribute details on the stories at the beginning of the process. So you're getting performance information at step one before any code is written. And you need to think about how you could test that particular component or feature as soon as possible, which means in development, Maybe you have service virtualization or stubs and you can run just a 10 thread unit test and look for race conditions and you can see, hey, is this query even possible? Can I run small concurrent load in development and think about how to test that as soon as possible in development and at each step along the way? At what point can I do it? Now, the one mistake you might make is over testing. We don't want to over test or over and thus overthink performance and development. So don't over test, meaning I don't need to run a thousand user no think time test in development. The numbers are useless because you're not in a production like environment. Um, you don't want to over measure. You, would, you know, look at response time, look at volume. Maybe you look at number of calls, uh, throughput and things like that. But you don't need to measure everything as if it were production because in development and maybe early testing it, it's not like development. And thus avoid overthinking stuff. And then my recommendation is that you make a decision to move to the next step in the flow that promotional decision based on the trend lines. So if I'm, if I'm testing and development and I check in my every day and on Monday the performance is 250 milliseconds, Tuesday 250 milliseconds, thir uh, Wednesday 250 milliseconds, and on Thursday 1.7 seconds. You're like, what happened on Thursday? Because we were looking really good Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you want to make a decision based on the trend or the tolerance, if you're out of tolerance, then you're like, I, 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 need, I can't promote this in the pipeline. So if you have Jenkins, you would actually fail on those tolerances. You want to automate the default action, meaning if we're in tolerance and the trend looks good, the default action should be package it up, put it in, and go to the next step of QA testing, next step of integration testing, uh, next step of larger scale load tests. And then actually, eventually, if everything is green on the promotional flow, you get this thing into production and you can do that swiftly, right? It should be automated if everything looks green. Only block those exceptions. Only block the promotional flow if something really breaks. Uh, and that's, you're basically automating the pipeline to do that for you. Um, and then I think in the feedback flow, you're going to leverage information from feedback into the promotional flow. So learning from production, learning from load test, all the way back into development. So when a new story comes along that says, we need to support 50,000 users with one second response time, you have the latest production information to write that story more realistically, and bef again, before you really get into writing the code. Let's talk about the feedback uh, loop just a little bit. Performance engineering feedback is interesting because the purpose of feedback is to facilitate performance awareness, meaning you want every engineer and every tester, every PM person to understand and, uh, and, and know the meaning of the performance data. Like if I just yell out, hey, there's uh, 240 hits per second on the site. Well, what is that? What is that? Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know what those numbers mean. So if you bring that feedback from production and these ops guys know this stuff, developers, I don't know what that means. Is that good? Oh, we've got uh, 45 second latencies within the network. Okay, that's huge. Uh, it should be failing and stuff, right? So you're really looking to take feedback and facilitate performance awareness and impact others with your knowledge. Like I say, infect them with performance and enthusiasm and leveraging information from the real world, which means you could learn from beyond your company, beyond operations, how much to leverage the real world information. Analyze and prioritize your understanding, meaning don't go to a developer and overwhelm them with all sorts of data and measures, right? Have some priority and understanding of, well, I think this developer is having a memory issue and garbage collection, so let's just talk about GC promotes, let's talk about time in GC. Provide your insights and suggestions, and again, get, get your information about performance from feedback to influence people all the way back in development. Um, those feedback flows 
are interesting because they also have little uh, feedback uh, triage, like in production, you can have a triage loop uh, where you're sort of looping just prod. Sometimes I have strategic load tests, like I have a, a strange holiday spike test that would run, and I don't run it on the promotional flow with every build that's automated, but every now and then I'll fire up, uh, you know, say, hey, let me go run these kinds of strategic tests or an ad hoc test for disaster recovery or something. could be really interesting, but it's a little feedback flow, and I learn from that and send it on to architecture, and architect people might come back and say, hey, let's move to a new queuing system because we think uh, the, the old stuff sucks, so let's try something new or let's put our queues in the cloud, and so they're going to do some load test and performance work in the discipline as well. So you have these minor feedback loops as well in each of the disciplines. And that's how those minor feedback loops is where you infect other engineers with your understanding and insight. So they give a ha-ha moment, you infect them with some kind of, this is a performance uh, serum, you can put uh, transactions per second inside that little serum and you just shoot it right in there. Or in the matrix, you can just plug them in to all your information. So that's like you take your Dynatrace dashboard or uh, stuff from Nagios, and you can actually just take the Ethernet cord and plug, plug it right in their head. It's perfect. And they'll be like, I can puzzles. So he represent Again, is is Learn. I uh, about or can make confident what to do now. Management and truly As for her production, twenty role making decisions along each of those flows. What we want to do with continuous performance learning is what information about performance can I provide at each of these points to help somebody learn and thus make a better decision about performance. And that's kind of how I think about continuous learning about performance spread across these promotional flows and feedback flows. Um, of course, there's your, your two lines for continuous integration, continuous delivery. The last thing I want to cover, and then we'll turn it over for some questions, uh, is that there are a lot of people talk about automation frameworks. And so how do I automate my performance testing and, and get a pipeline going? Like Mark, you're talking about this continuous performance stuff. Uh, so tell me about it. I will say there's uh, these are kind of the requirements in my head right now uh, that I'm deciphering. One, self-service measurements. So I talk about developers running unit level load tests like 10 threads and every engineer should be able to build those tests, submit them and execute them. And you might do that through a framework like Locust. You might build that in. You might have it in team system. Um, but ultimately, like my guys, who uh, I would love to have them do it in JMeter, but even you can just do curl. But give them a framework that allows them to build, submit, and execute a test, get the monitoring and profiling and logging, it, it's by default, and everyone has access to the logs. I hate when mon people don't have access to the monitoring because you can't do good performance work. And in this sort of development early management uh, or early testing, those test environments may be ephemeral. It, it, they may build on the fly, build up the test data. They're very small, independent kinds of tests. But you've got to have some kind of self-service measurement and it needs to be able to be scheduled and or hooked directly to your pipeline, your Jenkins, Bamboo, Team City, whatever you have. And so that API right on the flow could fire up a test environment and that engineer that grabs the grabs the JMeter script and it automatically runs that. Then there's a different thing I call scheduled measurements, which are 
um, not necessarily directly linked to your Jenkins pipeline or your automation pipeline for continuous integration, but it is running with its own pipeline nonstop. So let's say I have a load test that runs every other hour on the hour. And of course, developers, release managers, testers, whatever you need to do, you can push changes into the load test environment and then it just sort of has this constant cron type schedule. I would do this in Rundeck myself. Um, and that nonstop schedule means, hey, if you guys get a push of your code in there, we'll get you some load test results during the day. Another alternative way to do this and I, is to have you know, a baseline test, a scale test, 1x, 2x, 3x, and a stress test, and do three of them in the morning, three of them in the afternoon, and then run a long 12-hour soak test overnight. And in one 24-hour period, you could have multiple versions being pushed. Everyone in DevOps it keeps pushing for zero downtime and this kind of stuff. Well, this is a good way to prove it. In the middle of in the middle of running, you should be able to push stuff. And in the middle of a test, and it shouldn't blow anything up. Because if it does, probably going to blow up production, and that's not good either. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, you can't just flip on the switch and go continuous overnight. So you might need to split the schedule where you do continuous work on Thursdays and Fridays, maybe over the weekend, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you have sort of an ad hoc self-service kind of day. So anyone could say, hey, there's the continuous queues are stopped. So you could get in, push something, experiment, flashback, reconfigure, and you could have a couple of days in the schedule that are mixed up uh, between the two. So these are sort of the different modes of continuous performance that I'm trying to enable uh, and I see being enabled at places uh, around around the, your internet neighborhood. And, uh, and so in summary, um, we talked about how the heck we got to DevOps and believe me, starting way back with continuous improvement in the 1950s, getting all the way to continuous performance in the 2017s, so this has been a very long and somewhat strange trip. Uh, I talked specifically about how to bring your performance engineering into DevOps practices for you, those of you that are in the DevOps world and focusing on the, promo the performance flows, so a flow for promoting code to production and having performance information along the flow. Remember the decision points uh, at each step, so performance feedback at each step of those flows. And then the continuous performance modes, tools, and trends, and particularly how do I uh, enable continuous performance testing, what kinds of tools could we uh, use to do that, and then of course what are the kinds of trends that you will find. Um, and Dara, that's, that's what I have uh, for performance engineering or performance in a DevOps world, my friend. Thank you very much, Mark, for that. Let me just open up my screen here again briefly, and we're going to run through one or two more slides before we look at your questions. And I'll just open that up here now. Okay, um, and if you have any questions for Mark, please type them now if you haven't already done so. We have some more webinars taking place this week. Um, I have a webinar this coming Thursday with Elad Suffer, and he's looking at scaling agile with large-scale Scrum. And we have a whole host of other webinars coming up over the coming months. And the, the webinars that are taking place next month are with Gil Zelberfield. And he'll be looking at test-driven development. And we have another webinar as well with Michael Bolton, who will be looking at test cases. And we have other webinars here in May and June that will look at the area of agile leadership for test teams as well as Java memory. Now our program committee were over in Galway recently to pick the program for the upcoming Eurostar Conference 2017, which is taking place in Copenhagen from the 6th to the 9th of November. And after two difficult days of deliberating, they finally put together a program which I think you guys would really enjoy. And between now and our program launch, we have a really great discount, a 20% off all ticket prices right up until midnight on the 19th of April. And if you want to find out more about this, just head over to the Eurostar website forward slash pre-launch discount 2017. And if you can't wait until November to, to attend one of the Eurostar conferences, we've got a brand new conference which is going to be taking place in May 
It's a one-day conference uh, called Odin Star, which will take place in Oslo on May 11th. And all the details about this brand new conference can be found at the Eurostar software testing.com forward slash Odin Star. So let's have a look at some of the questions that are coming in here. The first question I have for you, Mark, mentions that you guys start doing performance in Agile before DevOps. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that I, I think that's very correct in terms of what our experience was. At least in my current role, I'm full time with PayPal, but I was a contractor before. Then, it basically doing the same thing. And yeah, it's an agile shop, and and I think there's a lot of mis misunderstanding as you know how people started in agile and moved to DevOps. But the idea is that you actually do, that's not really what the DevOps is, right? DevOps is not a replacement to agile. You can still code. You could code in waterfall, and still adopt some of these merging and blending teams of of developers and operations, and having the pipelines and the automation that are sort of part of this culture. Uh, that are not only say culture, but a part of the practices or disciplines that people are changing and adopting, optimizing. So you, they're not incompatible in any in any way. Um, so the, it just so happens that I think a lot of people that start working at, in an agile, more collaborative pairing kind of way, um, w may find that they're leaning towards DevOps because it, maybe there's some similarities in the continuum. They're like, well, we're agile, and we're getting you know a code coming out of agile. If you read uh, Jez's uh, the continuous delivery book, you know you, we have these great concepts for creating value in software, a feature or a, an entire app or something like that. And if it, if it comes out every two weeks as a sprint, shouldn't I try to get that to market? Shouldn't I try to get it out there as a fix to to you know to boost things to get it out there to the market as fast as possible? So then it just makes sense that you know old school kind of separated dev and ops is a very slow process. It's very manual. Uh, it can you know, not be very resilient uh, in terms of failover and stuff. So the risk is, goes up. Even though Agile is giving these lower risk, smaller releases, the rest of the process was still big risk, big release kind of stuff. So, so yeah, I think for us um, and our particular experience and others that I've talked to, it, it's a natural next step. Because because if Agile is working well, you should be able to release those lower risk things almost immediately and or continuously, uh, and that's a big part of, of what you'd read. You'd read that in the DevOps handbook too. When I think about those guys researching Nordstroms and some of the other stories about DevOps transformation, sure. I hear DevOps states that we should automate everything. Is this true? And um, what do you think of this statement? I, I don't I don't I think it's silly. Don't you think it's silly? Automate I'll automate all the things. It makes a great T-shirt, doesn't it? Like you see the little guy, the little cartoon character. That's the, the autom automate all the things. I think it would be good. Um, I think I think everything is worth looking at for automation, but not everything should be automated. And I think Richard uh, Bradshaw I, he threw out there I think recently you should automate 100% of everything that should be automated. But that still leaves the question, what things do not need to be automated? And I, I also see, uh, Dara, I see a lot of, um, uh, a lot of um, people that don't automate the final release decision. Like they automate the pipeline, but they still have a human being sort of pushing that final button to decide that they release it or not. And it doesn't last long because it's like they become just you know, a button pusher, and that's kind of silly. Uh, so yeah, automate 100% automate of all the things that should be automated, but then think critically about, do I really need to automate every test, every script, every deployment piece, starting, stop, on any function? Basically, if, if a human being is bored and tired and fallible in doing something, consider automating it. But if a human being is creative and energized and dealing with nuances and subtlety and variation, you may not automate that because the human mind and the human brain can, can process that much faster. And I'll have to just take one more question here because we've gone a little bit over time. Um, uh, last question I want to ask you here, Mark, is why should we do DevOps anyway? And um, why did you guys move to DevOps? Why did we 
why did we start why rename rename the team basically pulling together dev and ops and this I think I think people for those very reasons that there if you do provide value and I remember bringing up Nick Carr and this idea that IT was no longer differentiated and there was a lot of cutting and there was a lot of things happening in the enterprise space to consolidate spend and all these kinds of things um, and I think we're in yet another era where it's extremely low overhead and some people call it no ops they get to the point where there's not, not really ops people anymore but guess what a lot of people are still doing ops um, so I think it I think it has to do with uh, IT managers and even companies understanding that they can be really lean if they use the, these techniques, if they use these techniques for automation, if they use these techniques for monitoring and, and automated decision making, um, and really understanding you know stuff that is totally not necessary or totally overhead uh, to doing it. And I guess to, from my perspective, I think that's where, um, in, in my position, we're a small division in the greater PayPal world. And we have we have to run really lean, and we'll continue to run lean. Um, it's also, I, I think it's also that next step, like I mentioned about agile. I think it's that next conclusion of if I do agile right, and I'm able to get valuable code out all the time, uh, and I get it out more frequently, and it's stable, and it's and it, and it's deployable, um, then I got, I need to go the next step and really make sure delivering it all the way to production. Uh, it works uh, works equally as as flawlessly, and I think that's the next logical step. All right, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, finish up there. We've got a little over time, and I'd really like to thank our presenter today, Mark Tomlinson, for taking time out and talking to us about um, performance in DevOps, and we really appreciate it. We also appreciate all of our attendees coming along today, and apologies that we can't get through all of your questions. Uh, one question that did pop up a few times was, is this webinar being recorded? And the answer is yes, we record all of our webinars, and I will send you all a link to the webinar recording shortly after this webinar ends. So thank you all, everyone, and we hope to see you at future Eurostar webinars.